I am Werner von Braun, speaking for the Alabama Space and Rocket Center. For Time magazine, Werner von Braun was one of the most important people of the last century, a symbol of Western space travel. Others, however, saw him as a war criminal who deserved to be in the dock at the Nuremberg trials. He was one of the pioneers of rocket research and, at the time of the Second World War, was the technical director at the rocket research site in Pienemunde. The V-2 was developed under his leadership during the Second World War. Even before the end of the war, he made contact with the American military, worked in the USA after the war, was involved in a few projects at NASA, and was responsible for the development of the Saturn V. Even in 2003, in the course of a survey on the centenary of the first motorized flight by the American magazine Aviation Week and Space Technology, Werner von Braun was voted second among the 100 stars of aerospace, just behind the Wright brothers and even ahead of Robert Goddard. In addition, the Werner von Braun Memorial Award of the National Space Society NSS, is still presented in odd-numbered years for significant management and leadership achievements in space projects. Yet, it's difficult for today's generation of people to appreciate the technical achievement without addressing the downsides. He can certainly be described as an opportunist who had no qualms about putting his skills at the disposal of the Army Weapons Office and, after the seizure of power, the Nazis, for whom there were only technical but no moral problems in building the V-2. Satirist and mathematician Tom Leha expressed this opportunism through a song lyric, Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. However, for a long time, it did not look as if he were to play such a significant role in the history of space travel. Werner Magnus Maximilian von Braun was born on March the 23rd, 1912, in the town of Versitz, in the province of Persen, in the German Empire. He developed a passion for rockets at a young age and was particularly taken with the work Two Planets by the founder of German science fiction, Kurt Laswitz. At the age of 17, he wrote his own science fiction story entitled Lunetta, in which two stranded polar explorers are rescued by a rocket plane and taken to a space station. But from his school days at the French gymnasium in Berlin, it's known that he often skipped physics and math classes to tinker at home. Once, he constructed a rocket car by mounting fireworks on a hand cart and thus caused fear and terror in the streets. Since he was threatened with non-transfer due to poor performance in mathematics and physics, Werner von Braun was sent at the age of 13 to a boarding school where he took his Abitur exams in April 1930. Only when he got the book The Rocket into Planetary Space by Hermann Oberth from 1923, whose third edition from 1960 he later wrote the preface and had difficulties understanding the many mathematical formulas, he developed the ambition to improve his mathematical performance. Later, he wrote a number of manuscripts in which he dealt with a trip to the moon and acted as team leader in the construction of a small observatory. In 1930, he became a member of the Verein für Raumschifffahrt, VFR, founded in 1927, and not only enrolled at the Technical University of Berlin, but also worked at a rocket test site in Kummersdorf, where he and some other enthusiasts made their first experiments with liquid rocket engines. In the summer semester of 1931, von Braun studied at the ETH Zurich and conducted experiments in his student digs with mice that were tossed around in circles on a bicycle rim until they perished. In April 1934, he submitted his dissertation, Construction, Theoretical and Experimental Solution to the Problem of Liquid Propellant Rocket, but it was subject to secrecy and was not published until 1960. In May 1937, the rocket research site in Pienemunde was opened and von Braun became its technical director. Through his leadership style, which was sometimes collegial and sometimes authoritarian, depending on the situation, von Braun never yelled at any of his employees and he succeeded in forming a close-knit community at Pienemunde that achieved tremendous technological breakthroughs in rocket technology. On October 3, 1942, a rocket reached the frontier of space for the first time. Von Braun was an NSDAP member from 1937 and an SS member from 1940. It was not that the gun was put to his chest, he had the choice, but probably out of opportunism, Von Braun decided to accept the offer in order to be favoured in the allocation of resources. 
On July the 8th, 1943, von Braun and Walter Dornberger personally showed Hitler a film of the successful launch of a V2, to which he responded enthusiastically and appointed von Braun professor. Nevertheless, he continued to talk about the peaceful use of the rockets he had developed and was therefore arrested by the Gestapo in 1944, together with Klaus Riedel, Helmut Grottrup, and his brother Magnus von Braun, at the instigation of Heinrich Himmler. It was only through the intervention of Albert Speer and Walter Dornberger that his release was achieved after two weeks. After a British bombing raid on Pienemunde on the night of August 17, 1943, von Braun had the courage to run into his burning house to save the most important files, but it has not been handed down that he also had the courage to stand up for the many forced labourers who had to produce the V2 under catastrophic conditions. However, it is known that Werner von Braun wrote to the French physics professor Charles Sadron, 1902-1993, and tried to get some relief for him. The V2 was probably the only weapon system in mass production whose manufacture cost many more lives than its use. It was particularly tragic that most of the dead, as a result of the bombing, were concentration camp prisoners who had been used to manufacture the rockets at Pienemunde since June 1943. After that, the production of the rockets was moved to underground facilities in the Haas Mountains, further worsening conditions for the prisoners. After the war, von Braun initially declared that he had known nothing of the suffering of the concentration camp prisoners, but even then, no one believed him because of his position and the catastrophic conditions. It was not until 1969 that he made statements to the effect that the suffering of the concentration camp prisoners had burdened him and that he was ashamed that such a thing was possible in Germany. After the war, von Braun was occasionally criticized for the V2 rockets that were fired primarily at London and Antwerp. He himself once said, science has no moral dimension, it is like a knife. If you give it to a surgeon and a murderer, each uses it in his own way. Yet in 1952, he publicly confessed in American magazine, as a German scientist under Hitler, I was responsible for the V2 program, which created the deadly rocket weapons the Nazis used to terrorize their enemies towards the end of the war. In the same year, von Braun published in Collier's magazine the idea of a three-story ring-shaped space station with a diameter of 75 meters, which could also simulate gravity by rotating on its own axis. In the book Conquest of Space, written by von Braun together with Willy Ley, he specified his idea of a space station. He saw it as a springboard for space exploration, but equally as an effective atomic bomb carrier to successfully prevent wars. It is also interesting to note that von Braun always assumed that everything would have to be manned, since, in his view, there could be no automatic control by an electronic brain, as this will never be possible to construct. In 1955, he also made the Walt Disney film Man in Space, and later the two films Man and the Moon and Mars and Beyond. This led to von Braun becoming a well-known figure in the US, and his autographs became almost as popular with schoolchildren as those of Elvis Presley. In addition, the magazine Life referred to him in 1957 as the Seer of Space, and the men's magazine True even called him the Columbus of Space two years later. On October the 4th, 1957, the launch of the 83.6 kilogram Soviet satellite Sputnik caused a real shock in the USA, and the next day, most Western newspapers had this topic on the front page. Surprisingly, however, there were only a few lines in the Soviet newspaper Pravda, and it almost seems that the Soviet leadership itself was surprised by the reaction of the world's press and world public. The US President Eisenhower also underestimated the reaction in the American public that this event triggered, especially since the US could have still preempted the Soviet Union. But according to official statements, Eisenhower had refused to allow a rocket to be developed for the American military to be used to launch a civilian satellite into space. But since the favored Vanguard rocket was also based on US Navy technology, it's more likely that Eisenhower did not want a rocket developed by Werner von Braun and his team to launch the first American satellite. As a result, during a test launch of a Juno-1 rocket in September 1956, the final stage propellant was replaced with sand to avoid entering orbit. Although both the US and the Soviet Union had announced the launch of a satellite as early as the summer of 1955, the West did not believe that the Soviet Union was technically capable of doing so. Since there had been many failures on both the Soviet and the American sides, the public was only informed of the success after several orbits by Radio Moscow. 
This triumph was made possible due to a strategic disadvantage of the Soviet Union in the Cold War because the Soviet nuclear warheads were much larger and significantly heavier than their American counterparts, and therefore they were forced to develop large and more powerful rockets from the very beginning. But this was a great advantage for the space ambitions of the Soviets. A shorter time later, more precisely on November 3, 1957, the Soviets launched the second Sputnik mission with a living being on board, namely the dog Laika, for whom, unfortunately, there was no possibility of survival from the outset. The shock for the Americans became even greater in 1957, as the American response to Sputnik failed in front of an assembled world press. On December 4, 1957, the Vanguard rocket, whose launch had been brought forward because of Sputnik, exploded. It was not until February 1, 1958, that the US succeeded in launching a satellite, Explorer 1. This satellite, equipped with a magnetometer and Geiger counter, discovered the Van Allen radiation belt and ensured that one man in particular was hailed a hero, Werner Von Braun, and the people of Huntsville, Alabama literally danced in the streets. On April 12, 1961, history was made again. Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin launched a Vostok rocket on the first manned spaceflight in history, and the Soviets narrowly came out on top again. But thanks to Werner von Braun, the US was able to respond a month later by sending Alan Shepard on a suborbital flight into space. In 1965, he published a paper. In it, he dreamed of manned round trips to Venus, beginning in 1975, and to Mars in 1978, as well as a manned Mars landing for 1982. Later, even a manned Mars station would follow. The reason he gave for this was that we must not stop expanding the spheres of our activity and that we must open up new settlement areas due to the population explosion. He also wrote in the 1967 book Space Frontier about the use of space factories where completely new directions could be taken, especially in metallurgy without gravity. After the manned moon landing had succeeded, Werner von Braun was particularly pleased about a telegram from the British politician Duncan Sandys who was not only Churchill's son-in-law, but also responsible for the protection of the civilian population from German rocket attacks during World War II. The letter wrote, Hearty congratulations for the great contribution you have made to this historic act. At the time of the Apollo project, there were about 400,000 people working in the US space program, but only about 5% of them worked directly for NASA, and yet he and his team made a decisive contribution. For it was under his leadership that not only the Redstone family of rockets was created, which, although it was the first nuclear weapon launch vehicle in the USA, also carried the first American satellite and the first American astronaut into space, but above all, the Saturn V lunar rocket that, for decades, was the most powerful rocket in the world. In recent years, there's been an increase in critical reporting about him, and there have even been attempts to disparage his achievements. At the summit of this development is an article of the German newspaper FAZ, published in German and English, link in the description, from the year 2019, in which someone with a bachelor degree in cultural studies claimed that von Braun on the rocket test site simply didn't have the technical expertise to engineer, much less build. He wasn't able to handle liquid oxygen. His dissertation has several inconsistencies. And finally, his clearly demonstrated technical shortcomings. According to this article, Werner von Braun would not have understood anything about rockets, neither practically nor theoretically, and it was suggested that he had been some kind of imposter. Furthermore, schools and streets with his name had to be renamed in Germany due to political pressure. I'm sure he was an ambivalent figure who could have tried to help more people during the Nazi era, but I'm also sure that without him, the US would not have landed on the moon in 1969. Moreover, he was undoubtedly not only a significant engineer, but also a talented manager. After a technician admitted to possibly causing a short circuit in a rocket that had gone out of control, Von Braun gave him a bottle of champagne, because this admission avoided costly design changes. 